below the surface. I'm your host, Stacia Hurley, and I'm here today with uh, Barracuda CTO Fleming, she, and Mahendra Pruitt, Endpoint Security Engineer with our SOC team. Before we get started, a quick reminder that you can ask questions in the comment section below, or feel free to just say hello and let us know where you're watching from. Also, if you have missed any of our shows over the last few months, you can check them out at the Barracuda website at barracuda.com slash below underscore the underscore surface. So now to today's show. We'll be di uh, discussing destructive malware and other threats that we've been monitoring that you should be aware of. So please join me in welcoming Fleming and Mahendra. Hi, guys. Hi. Are you hey. um, so excited to have you both on the show. Um, before we get started on the questions, can you tell us a bit about yourself? So Fleming, why don't you go first? Sure, definitely. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, glad to be back, uh, being here before, and uh, it's exciting to share uh, some of the insights we have. And my name is Fleming and uh, CTO at Barracuda Networks. Perfect. And Mahendra? Hey guys, yeah, I've been uh, working here for about a year now in the SOC team. Um, I used to work as a cybersecurity analyst, now I work as a uh, escalation point for any endpoint related issues. Excellent. Um, so let's get started and, and uh, find out um, from Mahendra perhaps um, what kind of threats we've been seeing since the beginning of the conflict. You know, are we seeing more or less attacks than, they, than we have been uh, in the months leading up to uh, sort of the, the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, do you have any any background there that you might be able to share with us? Yeah, so actually uh, I was a cybersecurity analyst when the conflict started. Um, we were on very high alert because of the activity that we were seeing. There was a lot of scanning activity in particular um, from Russia. Um, mal malware in particular for destructive malware, there was the hermetic wiper and related strains that we were very scared of. So we made a lot of rules in terms of that and the Russia scanning activity. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like, love to add to that. Um, Mahindra touched on it. The the hermetic um, destructive malware was something that was actually published by Microsoft a little bit about the, the two stages it actually mm -hmm. carries through. Um, in, in fact, uh, at Barracuda, um, the core um, threat, uh, you know, detection platforms that we have we saw those uh, in the early uh, early part of mid part of uh, January. So uh, obviously, once we see it, um, it becomes a signal that um, gets uh, gets propagated. Um, and uh, these type of uh, destructive malware are very different in a, in a way they operate. Right? They're not ransomware where you can pick up the phone. Hey, let's negotiate how much I need to pay to get my data back, and not have you expose my uh, customer data. In this case, Thank you me. may end up with a um, uh, basically, a, 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 a bricked uh, uh, endpoint or laptop or computer or system in the cloud. Doesn't matter uh, where it is, uh, it is very different type of uh, uh, attack. So, uh, making a, some adjustments is needed. Yeah, yeah, in response. Yeah. Do we see, I don't know that we saw hermetic uh, wiperware being deployed um, against targets kind of uh, in the West, I should say. I, I, uh, I think maybe they were using it kind of more in in the area of the conflict, but I don't have we ha had any confirmation of any of those attacks happening outside of that area. I haven't seen any confirmation of those attacks happening outside of that area. In fact, some of these strains actually have some logic where if it's not Ukraine or in that area that it will just disable itself. It won't do anything. But we still do see some traffic to related IPs to, uh, for Hermetic Wiper and related strains like that. Are we? Do you think in the coming months that we're going to see more of this, or is it impossible to tell? Um, it's uh, it's difficult to say because the because I mean the U.S. has been giving Ukraine a lot of uh, support. Um, in in terms. We've been getting a lot of threats from Russia, so it's quite possible that we might see either newer threats or the same threats coming at full force. Um, yeah. What sort of factors do you think um, that are affecting this this sort of decision to, to kind of limit it to a certain area? Um, 
and are we going to be seeing like uh, uh, these types of attacks, uh, you know, uh, sort of increase, or do you think we're going to be seeing more or less of uh, sort of the ransomware attacks that have been sort of now pushed off the front page a little bit? I think. Um, do you have any uh, any comments on that? Because I think it's gotten sort of quiet, but I don't think that the number of attacks, ransomware attacks, has gone down, or the number of breach type attacks. Uh, attempted breach type attacks have, right. has gone down. Do you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so the traffic is, the traffic increase mainly is due to the political tensions. Um, in terms of the ransomware attacks, um, threat groups are using different methods every day. Um, just another day, they were using ways to embed uh, persistence within Windows event logs to try to again, compromise uh, networks. Um, in terms of an increase, you've probably seen an increase in sectors like financial sectors and infrastructure sectors or energy sectors. Those are the main targets, especially with these political tensions increasing, because you saw when Russia was starting to attack Ukraine, they started going for infrastructure to try to wipe, like get rid of people's electricity, bring down internet, yeah. you know, so stuff like that. They're, they would try to get before the war started. Right. Yeah, and I and I think the risk of ransomware is probably never going to go away because there's a monetary component to that, and I think they're just switching gear to be uh, leveraging the wiperware or destructive malware to to make a case or delay certain communication. You know, so it's uh, it's part of their digital, uh, uh, I'd say, weaponry to to kind of create chaos, um, and mm -hmm. obviously. Um, you know, and one thing, like Mahindra mentioned earlier, there are some good news, right? Because, you know, there are a lot of alerts uh, being sent out, um, a lot of awareness being driven to to really have the shields up to make sure, um, you know, scans are failing. Uh, you know, if they're trying to hit your um, infrastructure that's externally facing, so they can really identify uh, openings to get in. But, you know, all it takes is a little bit to get in, then things can go wrong. So that's why we shouldn't uh, let any of our guards down at the moment. We need to continue to, uh, to, to you know, basically uh, block uh, traffic that, that looks suspicious coming from, uh, you know, the regions that's in conflict. Um, and I think uh, to the question whether ransom, ransomware is going to make a return, I have no doubt, uh, you know, at some point it's going to, uh, you know, private sectors as well as government and you know whoever it's vulnerable it will be facing those situations again um, but you know hopefully everyone's gotten a little better at responding to ransomware um, wipe aware is something that I'm a little bit more nervous about <laughs> yeah for people right I think too I mean uh, you know the the countries that had maybe a problem with hard currency, Right. I think that there's maybe um, a temptation to get some um, money that they can use in the country uh, through things like ransomware. Um, so it's in now with Bitcoin um, experiencing, you know, a major drop. I think that those that's always sort of interesting. I think that in some ways, I wonder how much of the rise of Bitcoin can be attributed to being able to pay off ransomware mm. <laughs> because it was such a problem for a while there. I don't have any proof of that. I, I wonder yeah. if you guys have any thoughts on that. The only way I'm thinking through that is that uh, digital currency is traceable. We have uh, actual mm -hmm. evidence that we have traced down certain you know uh, uh, threat groups and eventually recovered uh, uh, <clears throat> some of the cost, right? But I think, uh, you know whether it's related to bitcoin coming down it's uh you know the pressure coming from um the price i'm, I'm not sure uh, i think it you know it, they can just ask for more bitcoin <laughs> in many ways if you think about it right so i think the key still is related to the focus um everyone's very alert um you know kind of driving down successful attacks it's uh it's kind of hopeful um uh, you know, but recovery from a destructive malware uh, is different, right? And uh, we'll probably get into it in a little bit, but uh, love to hear Mahindra's uh, view on uh, cryptocurrency versus ransomware, uh, you know, sort of the uh, correlation. Yeah, well, um, we see a lot of the same, like, kind of fraud methods implemented in, like, with real currency and 
cryptocurrency. So third actors would actually do is they would send, if they get a Bitcoin payment or any type of other cryptocurrency payment, they'll send it to like a wallet and which goes to like a million other wallets to try to get the threat actor that money. Um, it, it's traceable. I mean, you can see all the transactions uh, because it's a cryptocurrency. You can see the transactions in the ledger, but um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when did our team sort of begin to first notice, um, sort of uh, become aware of and try and remediate some of the things that were going on, uh, perhaps connected to the conflict uh, in Ukraine? Uh, was that something that we saw right off the bat uh, when the conflict started or did it start a little bit before that? Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll let Mahindra answer this first uh, yeah. because he's in the front line. So sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So we started we started putting blacklist in as early as January when we first started seeing things going on. Um, we had our red team put blacklist in. We started kicking rules off. We were observing the conflict really, really closely, keeping up with news articles coming out every day. So we started ramping up on the amount of rules that we're creating to watch this type of malicious traffic that was going to our customers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you, go ahead. Yeah. Similarly, I, I think the the data that shows that we have um, is really late December, early January, we start to see scans, a uh, little bit increased scans and obviously putting, putting them down with the proper GOIP, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> allocation of, uh, um, where Russia is and, and Belarus and all uh, it was helpful. Um, but also when we start seeing the actual destructive malware, it's uh, uh, middle of January. And we, we saw in our advanced persistent threat uh, scanning layer um, because it's attached to many of our products. So the so I would say the, the blast radius is very broad. So when we see it, uh, we can we can pull it out. And it's pretty straightforward. Once you get the shot 56, the fingerprint of the IOC, we will be able to compare it to every everyone else's notes, right? So, yeah, mid mid of January we start seeing that. Uh, not o not only in addition mm -hmm. to the rules, we've also been really ramping up on our threat hunting efforts. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking for both like the IOCs, but also we're looking for TTPs, which are the threat like the tactics that the threat actors are using. So we're not only targeting the IOCs, we're targeting mm -hmm. like how they work to try to counteract what they might do in the future yeah is um hunting these types of threats any different from um what you would see with sort of garden variety ransomware um no uh, actually no because with ransomware i mean you'd look for the iocs as well but mm -hmm. it, it really de also depends on the group right so the threat actors from russia or like related countries they might use different techniques to compromise the network um, threat actors from like, let's say like North Korea or like a different country might use different, uh, tactics as well. Like when it comes to like ransomware and stuff like that. So it like really depends on, uh, the group and like the IOCs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To that degree, I think the destructive malware or wiperware versus ransomware, it's like, Unfortunately, it's like a little switch for them. They can figure out ways to get in and they can choose, oh, should I go ransom or should I just wipe out the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so they have that kind of, uh, unfortunately, they have that kind of uh, flexibility. So I think, you know, if you look at the MITRE attack framework, you know, the methodology they, uh, they use, a lot of them Mahindra has to really kind of, and team have to basically uh, map to, uh, to actually detect those signals. I will say today's world, um, in terms of detection and response, um, requires extend, extended, um, w which is what we call XDR, extended detection and response kind of capability, mm -hmm. because you need signals from every attack surface uh, to really understand what's really happening, right? And someone click on something, um, you know, additionally, the next, uh, next move is something gets installed on the system. Uh, start running in, you know, in memory. As soon as you reboot, everything goes haywire. You know, master, you know, boot record gets uh, wiped out, or you know, uh, certain files, you know, certain important operating system files getting zeroed out or you know, um, nullified. In those situations, are uh, all the sig uh, all the patterns. I think uh, a, a, a successful SOC will have to be able to uh, to 
to trap and uh, examine, right? So, and mm -hmm. I think that's that's the key why having a more uh, comprehensive data set, uh, drawing insights and collab, uh, you know, cor uh, correlate uh, the, the insight, uh, the signals to into the insights, then eventually take action is needed for other modern threat hunting uh, tasks. Yeah. Right. So you're basically, I mean, the main thing is to sort of, um, you know, prevent the breach, right? Because once once they have the breach, they can do whatever they like, as you say, Fleming, right? Mm -hmm. They can install malware, uh, you know, that is ransomware or malware that is more of like a wiperware type of thing, or they can just steal the data. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess one of the, the big questions becomes, you know, what can um, companies be doing to prevent the breach or what are the most important things that companies can be doing uh you know to prevent the breach in the first place um do you guys want to talk a little bit through that um yeah so what like we we always want to have a layered approach to security um you know we want people to have like their endpoint security their firewalls they have different layers so threat actor gets through one one of the layers of defense you know there's also there's another one that could protect you there's another one you know we want companies to have you know their firewalls two-factor authentication security awareness training because your users are your weakest link um you want to make sure that you do regular audits make sure no systems are open to the internet with uh insecure protocols but just like major services stuff like that Definitely, I, multi layered is is a key. Uh, very uh, very important to think about that. Um, I think one of the things, especially facing destructive malware, is consider a recovery plan as well. Uh, when you are um, there's a industry uh, term called RTO, uh, really recovery time objective. It's important for businesses' livelihood. Really, like how much time do you have really to recover from a, a, a major cyber attack? So understanding that, like if you are a business that completely transacts online and you need all your systems or you have to, <clears throat> let's just use an example, uh, Colonial Pipeline, right? You know, if the building system stops working, you can't really feed any more uh, gas because <laughs> you will be giving out free gas or you're not giving any gas. My thinking here is that understanding that key objective, then map it to what you need to do when you're facing with ransomware and destructive malware. With destructive malware, I am re recommending folks to think about uh, making sure you have not only backup of your data, but really split out your compute and data in some way so you can recover the entire system if you need to. Like if you lose your system, mm -hmm. right? Instead of trying to get your recovery USB disk installed and maybe someone has to run to a, a site to install it, and that's gonna take a lot of time. So the right thing to do is what is your plan in terms of making sure even you lose your compute, uh, you know, in a, in a cyber attack, you can bring it back in 24 hours versus mm -hmm. two weeks, right? Um, things like that. I think you really need to consider that RTO, uh, you know, uh, factor. Then, then it's a different thing. Because with ransomware, you could say, okay, this is a huge problem. Let's car insurance, negotiate down, pay the millions, boom, then you're back online. Your data is back, right? Uh, unfortunately, the, the one that we have saw, uh, you know, that it's really about wiping your, uh, you know, file allocation table, your your NTFS, uh, you know, file file table, master file tables, um, which means your your system will not boot, will not function. Uh, you know, a lot of pieces will be broken. <laughs> it's not just the directory that you had your critical data in that you need to recover, but the entire system is gone. So I think that is also an important part of uh, dealing with destructive malware on top of uh, all the multi-layer um, detection and uh, and the prevention capabilities that Mahindra mentioned. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. I mean, in terms of the recovery, I mean, uh, there was the community college, um, Lincoln College, I believe it was, where they, and this was with ransomware, um, mm -hmm. they could not recover and they ended up, they've been, in, they've been around since, you know, 1867 or something, and they had to... Oh. They had to close their doors because they could not recover um, in time after yeah. a ransomware attack um, to be able to, in, you know, to be able to enroll students. And yeah. so they just shut down the whole college, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, pretty surprising. But that's that's that sort of thing about if you don't have the the recovery systems in place, you, you may not really have too many options. 
Uh, yeah. I think with, their, with them, it was ransomware that hit them, but it was almost because they had no way of recovering. It was as destructive as as yeah. as possible. Um, yeah. um, what do you think if you had to pick something um, that people could be doing differently than what they're doing right now um, in terms of just general general things? What would you actually say on that? Um, in terms of what they should be doing in terms of, you know, should they be doing more training, uh, those types of things. Do you want to uh, go into that a little bit, Fleming? Sure. Um, I think uh, I think it's we have seen ransomware for many years. Um, you know, destructive malware is not new. Uh, 2017, NotPetya was actually a, supposed to be a ransomware, but it became a wiper because it didn't work as a ransomware. Um, um, so it's uh, unintentional, but to the degree where eventually people lost systems. Right. So I think, uh, uh, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, strategy already in play. Some of them may be, uh, it's easier to implement, some are harder to implement. But the ones that's easy, low hanging fruits, let's do them right away, right? Like, you know, first of all, MFA, like Mahendra yeah. mentioned, you know, don't leave any, uh, uh, you know, VPN uh, terminators running with just username and password, right? That's as, as simple as you can get. Like, you know, that is a door into your entire IP stack if you're left it open. Uh, and and remember, a lot of the credentials and a lot of people's data have been lost already. It's not like we are just starting to lose data. We've been losing data, unfortunately, to the bad guys for many years. So people will know who was your, uh, you know, previous employee who left the company? Maybe they can try it. They can. Who worked in your company as IT admins, which probably hold the key to key to the kingdom, if they crack that open, right? So all these are uh, easy ones to 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 address. And of course, training uh, humans understand not to click on things and phishing attacks and all these are uh, 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 basics. I think at the moment that we have to be doing. Uh, the part that uh, I think differently is treat wiperware a little bit with more urgency on related to your business uh, capability ability to recover right in a, in a cyber attack. Um, there's no FBI or insurance company can help you to recover your system. You need to really understand what that process is. I haven't even talked about the cloud workloads yet, right? You know, you, you get, first getting your laptop hacked and jacked is one thing but if you if you if somehow they get into laterally moving to your your cloud environment and sort of zombify all your compute and make your systems as weapons against others that's another area mm. to pay attention to obviously um you know that's a whole whole a lot of things to talk about in that range but generally um be prepared to recover uh you one of the things we do is uh we we talk about it, it's called rehydration so if you lose certain systems be able to uh, rebuild them uh, from scratch very quickly. That requires either infrastructure as code or, um, you know, ability to back up things and, you know, have with a golden image to actually, re uh, you know, restore and, and apply uh, the, the applications you need to, to run your business. So I think generally, um, overall, it's just a, a mentality to, to consider whiteboard to be more, more damaging uh, and uh, less recoverable. Uh, so with that me uh, mentality, you can, you know, make adjustments to, uh, to, uh, to, to address it. Yeah. Okay. Um, what kinds of concerns are we hearing most from uh, customers and partners? What kind of things are they running into that really are concerning them um, in this latest round? Um, Hendra, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the concerns have just been like a concern about the increase in Russian activity or like a new vulnerability that came out. Um, like the when Log4j, when major that major critical vulnerability came out for Log4j, we had so many clients reaching out to make sure like it was covered, that we were looking for that type of activity. Um, I mean, I personally see an increase in traffic from Russian IP addresses and our clients confirm whether we're like we have stuff set up to block that or if well we, we don't block we monitor what well, we we're, we're monitoring it um but yeah we've made a lot of rules to target that specific activity or anything that customers uh come to us with okay and are you seeing um are, are there attacks uh for specific types of um industries that you're seeing or verticals 
Yeah, so we are always on to be on the lookout in terms of that activity for our financial and our uh, like energy clients because those those clients are more prone to those attacks. Especially if you consider like energy clients, they might have what's called SCADA systems within their networks. First mm -hmm. of all, those systems should be air gapped, but if they're not, mm -hmm. a simple like network vulnerability vulnerability scan or a scan from a a compromised machine could just turn that system off. It could take it offline. It could ruin operations. Yeah, interesting uh, topic there uh, on SCADA, um, Hendra. Actually, one of the things uh, we at, at one of the shows that we actually showcased a windmill that's running on SCADA as an example. Uh, obviously, um, power generation um, uh, windmill. So what we need to do, like air gap, is a good uh, good way of describing it because sometimes you have to put in this uh, OT into maintenance mode and and which means you, you might actually have to switch off certain operational components and when during the maintenance mode you want to protect that environment with, you know making sure things don't get in so so there's a, a lot of techniques right so our experts in the, our cloud gen firewall team you know have a lot of ways to to, to you know, basically create that air gap that Mahindra mentioned to, to actually securely maintain a device and doing things like that. So yeah, I'd love to catch up on that with you, Mahindra, at some point too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I can I can talk about it right now because actually uh a good example of destructive malware with uh air gap networks is actually Stuxnet, hmm. which uh they specifically targeted Iranian nuclear facilities. Hmm. And basically what this uh this type of malware would do, it would take uh the sense like the sensor information it would stay in the network for a week even if it was an air gap network they could they could somehow bypass that maybe by mm -hmm. dropping usbs or whatever they would get information and then it would display normal information to the engineers but it the actual centrifuges and stuff it would spin the centrifuges so much that the actual nuclear uh, facilities that would blow up the yeah. centrifuges would blow up and uh, even if there were people around there you know that's pretty destructive if you ask yeah me. <laughs> that's uh, that's catastrophic in yeah. some way yeah if you think about it it's really i've seen even in uh, uh i think in many stories where basically they are replaying a, a normal behavior which unfortunately it's a shield for all the bad things that's happening behind the scene that's that's what you mean right mahendra yeah pretty yeah. much yeah yeah, it's it's like playing back uh, security footage or something on a camera. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, to that's the, another to way. The guy, <laughs> right, like in a movie or something, where you're like, yeah, everything's fine and normal, but actually it's just a loop of like two a.m. or whatever from a couple of days ago. So you don't realize that there's anything wrong. Oh, yeah. that's that's pretty. That, I hadn't heard of that one before. That's that's pretty <laughs> sneaky. Um, is that probably about the most surprising thing that you've seen, or have you seen anything else where you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that? That honestly, like when it comes to malware, nothing nothing surprises me anymore because these threat <laughs> actors are kind of ruthless out here. Like you take a uh, destructive malware in particular into consideration, like they get a hold of your machine, they'll wipe your MBR, they'll like ruin your 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 company. If you're a small business, you can't survive something like that. You might not have like ransomware insurance or any type of cyber insurance or any type of disaster recovery plan. Like you uh, mentioned the uh, community college earlier. The community college definitely probably would not have the resources to cover like a large scale impact like that. So you know, it's it's kind of sad when it comes to things like that. Nothing surprises me when it comes to these uh, threat actors. Do you think that there's um, more things that the government should be doing? I mean, what do you think about their actions so far that they've taken, and and what well, what would you like to see? I guess, or what do you think would be helpful there? In terms of the government, uh, they they already do a lot by giving us advisories, but like when it comes to a lot of people's livelihoods and with small businesses and stuff like that, maybe there should be like a like a kind of program to help businesses like that. If you make like a certain amount a year, maybe they could assist them when it comes to like a cyber attack. Yeah. I mean, that would take definitely a lot of resources, but Still, that's a lot of people's livelihoods and jobs at stake. If they their company could go down if uh, they get hit by a big compromise. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be a little bit more brutal. <laughs> I think uh, since we have voted in a whole bunch of leaders, in, uh, and they should be you know, obviously they also talked about infrastructure spending, right? So mm -hmm. where's that money 
use that money to increase security. And that is a major part of our infrastructure. Without security, we're basically kind of running loose and uh, unfortunately a big targets everywhere uh, for the bad guys, right? So I think spend majority of that money or at least a, a good chunk of it on cybersecurity and build up something that is far more resilient. Is it really a key thing? Yeah, you can, uh, they can uh, bolster our infrastructure as much as they want, but if they get past the security and ruin the infrastructure, then there's yeah. no point in bolstering it in the first place. Yeah. So um, what do you think are some of the key technologies or processes that uh, these organizations should be spending, uh, you know, money that they get from the government or elsewhere on? Um, Fleming, do you want to start off with that? Yeah, I mean, if we are able to, especially government, I, I, this is goes back a couple of years that I talked about how government agencies and uh, uh, municipalities are uh, super weak in that way mm -hmm. um, because they're just underfunded and there's no, not enough resources. Um, <clears throat> I think starting from there, because they also hold a lot of our critical information, personal information, right? Like who, right. where you live and all that stuff. It's actually in city halls it's not in a vault right like i um i walked into a city hall one time and started using their computer to look for records right because it, it's open but you know yeah. hey uh you know so i will say uh for for that i think definitely utilize <clears throat> what is um important is use utilize some of the new money that's uh being assigned to build out infrastructure really secure it so um instead of <clears throat> trying to block everything it really is within and it, upgrade the systems get the right people resources hired and 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 really uh, treat our uh, uh, you know data as as really important asset um, then I think for organizations is really about uh, considering the you know especially on the topic with destructive malware is is your uh, recovery plan and your dis disaster recovery plan and exercise and test uh, as you can go and probably <clears throat> also understand your profile of your business, right? If you run purely on SaaS, most of your uh, your tools are just compute. Your data is all in the SaaS. That's probably a good sign, but you still need to uh, manage who has access to those SaaS applications and what actions you can perform once right. you have access. Um, so zero trust uh, access type of uh, solution will be very useful, uh, especially if your endpoints are getting compromised and the security posture are weak, uh, they could steal your data, even if it's in a SaaS environment, right? Now, if you have systems that's running uh, proprietary applications on-prem that's not replaceable by SaaS, and then really consider uh, a full recovery of the entire system, uh, mm -hmm. not just parts of the data and, and, and all that, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm sure Mahindra, you have other uh, suggestions too. Yeah, I mean, my, my go-to will just always make sure they have the best practices. The small businesses will go over best practices and be like, no, we don't want that. We like it, but you have to. I mean, they get in, they get in, and you're going to be out of luck. Mm. And if they, I, I one thing I do want to mention, if there is shortage of uh, resource and you just can't do this because it's getting more complex and uh, too hard for you, I think there are, security uh, service providers, right? Which you can mm -hmm. reach out and uh, they're the experts. They're, they're doing it for a lot of small businesses and, and you know, be part of that and uh, get as much help as you can um, in that way. That's also a, a, a good way to start. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can also like get an MSP, a managed service provider. They will cover all of your IT needs and they yeah. might just employ a, another security provider like us. We will help monitor. We will help deploy endpoint security solutions, all that stuff. Yep. Right. So if you don't have the resources to do it yourself, basically, if you have an MSP uh, that has access to a SAC uh, a help desk or something like that, that means that you'll have the help from people like Mahendra, right? To yep. help them if, if there's any kind of problem. So that's yeah. definitely a good suggestion, I think, for, um, you know, smaller shops uh, should definitely be taking a look at that. Yep. Um, okay, so do we want to talk a little bit about um, some of the final thoughts, uh, you know, and, and recommendations? Uh, Fleming, do you want to kick us off there? Yeah, just a quick follow up on the one you just mentioned with MSP. I think do checking, make sure they have the right tools. If they're just running a, some 
you know, last generation SIM is probably not going to be good enough. So look for the, the acronym XDR, which is extended detection and response uh, okay. as a, as a, their threat hunting capability. So make sure your MSP and your security provider has that capability, ability to ingest data, correlate data, get insights, act on various different phases of a potential attack. Uh, that is an important thing. So that's one part. Um, other things, I think, uh, you know, some final thoughts. I, I think I have three things that I listed. Uh, really think about your response plan, right? Update your response plan targeting uh, destructive malware. Um, you're in a situation, if you are hit by one of these, uh, there's no negotiation. You have to find a way to re recover and consider your uh, recover uh, recovery time objective as a, as a key thing. Um, make sure you fit into that because that's how your business is going to survive or not survive, right? Um, and also educate employees about these threats. Uh, these threats are no longer just, oh, yeah, I got hit by a ransomware. So a, a folder got encrypted, you know, no big deal, just pay the ransom. So it's it's a lot more, uh, uh, I would say, high alert because you could lose uh, days and weeks of uh, productivity. And make sure you are following best practice, uh, like uh, Mahindra mentioned. Uh, don't um, uh, don't uh, actually uh, let go of any of it because it's important to to be uh, on top of um, the best practices in everything you do related to email, related to firewall, um, you know, com traffic coming from, uh, you know, Russia and uh, Belarus or anything like that. There are ways to do these things. So just make sure you follow them. Yeah. Fleming, do you want to mention what the CIA, CIA triad is that was on your slide? Yeah. So the main thing related to that is really it's an action plan that you have to uh, uh, play into. Um, uh, I think it's a, it's a key, it's not always the same for everyone. Uh, I think in, uh, in many ways, it's important to, to look at that triad as a, as a way for recovery and, and uh, response. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the key here is to uh, listen to the experts, uh, spend time um, making sure you're reading the news about CISA and a few other organizations mm -hmm. who are providing advice and and uh, stay on top of it, yeah. Yeah, that CISA website actually has a ton of resources. They've really expanded that out. Um, so they have advisories on there and they also do have some help if you are a small uh, business or you're a SLED, so you're state and local government or education customer, um, they have resources that will actually help you if you do get hit by ransomware. Um, so it's definitely worth taking a look at that site if you have not been up there uh, yet. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. go ahead. Definitely, definitely. I think, uh, uh, you know, if we want to go through the process of considering uh, what your posture is, there's many, many frameworks to follow. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, doesn't matter if it's a, a CIA or NIST or anything. It's really about how much you need to do for your business, right? What is available to your uh, to your user uh, uh, community, uh, what is important for your business integrity, and all these things are important. Uh, but I think uh, generally don't get hung up on that one set of framework, but really kind of get into the uh, best practices quickly, uh, especially related to destructive malware. Mahendra, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I just really wanted to bring up the uh, the low hanging fruit reference that uh, Fleming made earlier. That is a good way to good point to start if you don't know anything about security or if you just can't afford the resources like a firewall or a good protection service. Getting those low hanging fruit like strong password policy, like some user training or awareness, some two factor authentication, stuff like that is like really important. It's a good place to start in. In case of emergency, like at least you have like a uh, some defenses. Yeah, and by having them, you generate data signals. So in fact, when that happens, those data gets you know can be uh, ingested into a, a system like XDR backed uh, you know uh, SOC, right? Then with the data, you can actually trace, right? So if you don't do anything, you don't have any data to actually to track, right? right. So it's super important to do those things. Yeah. 
Okay, so unfortunately, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you both on uh, today's call, and I hope it was useful to our audience. Um, please let us know if there are any comments about this show. Um, and remember that you can watch all our LinkedIn live shows from the Barracuda website. Um, for now, that leaves me to say until next time, have a safe journey. Thank you.